back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Eskow, and my next guest is quickly becoming the hardest working man in the news business. Uh, David Sirota is, uh, like myself, uh, although at different times, a veteran of the Bernie Sanders uh, juggernaut. He is well known as a journalist, as an author, as at this point now, the I believe the host uh, or rather edit, managing editor of the Daily Poster. Right. Uh, and he is also the, a co-producer and uh, has story credit for the hit movie Don't Look Up. In addition, he has a new podcast entitled Meltdown, which we'll be discussing shortly. So, David Sirota, thanks for taking a little break from your busy schedule to join us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's always good to talk with you. Uh, uh, there's so much going on, and there's so much going on with you. But briefly, you know, people are going to want to hear about the movie. Uh, huge success. I don't think it needs the zero hour bump to uh, uh, to become popular. So, um, did it exceed your expectations? Oh, completely. I mean, I, look, wh- the movie about uh, an asteroid headed towards Earth. Uh, and scientists' uh, effort to get the word out about this. I I thought it would be a big movie because of the cast and because of the the message. I mean, it stars Leo DiCaprio, it stars Jennifer Lawrence, Meryl Streep, Jonah Hill, uh, and and plenty of others. I didn't expect it to be the, have the biggest uh, viewing week in the history of Netflix. Uh, It is now the number two biggest movie in the history of the world's largest a streaming platform. Uh, so likely more than 100 million people, maybe even 200 million people have seen this movie uh, in its first uh, less than a month being out. So that is way, way, way bigger than I ever thought. And my view is, is that it's in part the cast, it's in part the uh, the the message and the and the and look it's a fun movie. It's a there's some serious messages in it, but I but I also think there's a pent up demand among audiences across the world for uh, content that takes the climate crisis seriously. This movie is an allegory for uh, the struggles that scientists have in getting the word out about the climate crisis. Well, for the six people out there who haven't seen it yet, I do strongly recommend it. It's really funny. It's really entertaining. It makes its point. And, you know, David, there have been a little... You know, here and there, a little mostly it's gotten rave reviews. There have been pockets of criticism on the left. Well, maybe the ending wasn't like it didn't tell people where to march or whatever. But I think my wife, who's a screenwriter, had what I think was the smartest response to that, which is, well, go back and watch Dr. Strangelove, right? I mean, Dr. Strangelove didn't either, but it is remembered as not only a great movie, but the great commentary about uh, the the Cold War and the nuclear arms race in the early 60s. So first of all, you know, before we move on from the movie, I just want to say congratulations. Thank great you. job. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. You got it. And you also have a new publishing venture entitled The Daily Poster, which I take it, I take as an ironic, slightly ironic take on the fact that what bloggers have historically been known to do is blog stuff daily or post it daily. So uh, do I have that guess right? Yeah, you've got it exactly right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's a great outlet. You guys publish great stories. You and your... Your colleagues there, you keep cranking out stuff, so I encourage people to check it out. But uh, what I, and I'm happy to talk about it more at some point before we're done, but what I really wanted to talk to you about, David Sirota, more than anything else, I think, was your new podcast series, Meltdown. And the reason why I wanted to talk about it is because, uh, as I understand it, and two, I believe two episodes are out now, it's about the decisions made after the financial crisis in the Obama era that laid the groundwork for a Donald Trump presidency. Is that a fair summary? That's, that's basically correct. Yes, it's it's how the Obama administration's response to that crisis helped create the predictable backlash conditions for Donald Trump uh, and pr- prior to that, the Tea Party, but really for Trump and his movement. And what I'll tell you, David, the reason why I think that's so important is that we all know, and those of us who worked for Bernie especially may have a, a awareness of this, 
But for many years, it has been almost impossible to criticize Obama uh, in democratic or liberal circles or to point out what he did wrong and uh, the, the consequences of that. I mean, I still remember when I started writing for the Huffington Post, criticizing his response to the uh, crisis in 2010. I remember a funder uh, who funds good journalism taking me aside and saying, you've picked a lonely road for yourself. And I think a lot of us walked that lonely road for a long time. And I think it held uh, the Democratic Party back from, uh, and the left in general, from self-examination, right? Self-criticism, learning what we could do wrong. And uh, I I take it where you're going with this, even though only two episodes are out, is that, in fact, Trump was not a deus ex machina. He was not, and he was not the magical creation of a a Lex Luthor like Putin, but really the consequences of certain steps taken within our own Democratic Party and within our country. Is that a fair summary or statement? Absolutely. Donald Trump is not an anomaly. Donald Trump is a symptom of a larger problem. Uh, And, you know, the problem that we talk about in the in meltdown is is that there really has been a political meltdown uh, in America uh, since 2009, in my view, probably going back earlier, but really since 2009, a meltdown. And what, what, what that term really means is a a meltdown in people's last remaining faith in the government's willingness and ability to uh, help regular people. Uh, I think that has been going on. The erosion of trust in government obviously has been going on for a long time. You can trace it all the way back uh, to when Ronald Reagan said the nine scariest words in, in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Uh, right. that he was tapping into a growing feeling that the government uh, was ineffective, that the government wasn't delivering for regular people. Now, obviously, right wingers like Ronald Ronald Reagan and his movement were uh, self-interestedly chipping away and and fomenting uh, an anti-government feeling. But clearly, uh, that had built up into uh, the 90s, uh, into, I mean, Bill Clinton, the era of big government is over. I mean, that was a Democratic president saying that. Um, Obama comes in at this moment of incredible crisis, of incredible economic pain, Uh, And I would argue had one last remaining chance at a New Deal moment, uh, a moment to say, hey, you've heard a lot about how bad the government uh, is. Uh, There's a lot of disillusionment out there, uh, but we are at a 19 uh, early 1930s moment here, an FDR moment. And we are going to show that the government is really serious about helping regular people Uh, workaday families get through this crisis. And what Obama did, uh, and these are the broad strokes, but what he did was he decided first and foremost uh, to rescue uh, a handful of banks that had created the crisis. Uh, And he was much more serious about bailing out uh, a handful of those folks than helping millions and millions of people. And the average person uh, experienced uh, job loss, uh, wage declines, uh, in, in millions of cases, home lost while they were watching on their television, uh, the government swing quickly into action to rescue and bail out the wealthiest and most powerful people in the country, the people who had created the crisis. And none of them uh, went to jail. Uh, the fines that they received were essentially slaps on the wrist. Uh, and so what did this do to the social contract, the tattered social contract between Americans and their government? Americans who had already been told and heard and felt that their government hadn't really been delivering for them. This was maybe the last moment they had elected right. a president on a promise to make real change. And when hope and change became more of the same, the meltdown truly intensified first into the Tea Party, then into the backlash politics uh, of Donald Trump. And, you know, one of the things, one of the sort of poetic resonances of a word like meltdown in a case like this is that a nuclear meltdown, for example, is a chain reaction, right? Mm -hmm. One thing happens, then another, then another. And that's what we're talking about here. It's really quite heartbreaking when you think about it, isn't it, David? Because I believe that Obama was elected, you know, he ran on a platform of hope, the audacity of hope. I really believe he had a mandate 
to make New Deal type changes, to break up the big banks, to end the criminality, to really restore the programs that constitute the social contract. And he didn't do that. And I think you're exactly right. And I think you're, the premise of, of Meltdown, the podcast, is exactly right, that that disillusionment set in motion a chain reaction that took us to Trump and takes us to the alienation and drift we see today. And I think one of the important things is, you know, I think what happens, and I love your thoughts about this, is I think people like you and me, people like us who, for lack of a better term, just we're just absorbed in this stuff. I don't want to say politics nerds, but we're deep in this stuff. It's it's become second nature to us, but to the rest of the world, it's either forgotten or not clearly understood. I mean, maybe they remember that 10, 11 years ago, there was somebody saying that we really should regulate the banks more than we should or whatever. But really, I think, you know, what I get the sense from the first two episodes that you're doing is you're really going and picking apart the steps in the process where we went wrong. And um, right now, I think by uh, episode two, uh, I don't know if, I don't think you've reached Dodd Frank yet, but I think you're getting there. Yeah, um, when we get into that, and, and, and I should say all of the episodes are out now. Uh, so oh, they yeah, are, they're okay. All out now. So, so a couple points. I mean, I, you know, there, there are folks who will vaguely remember this era who don't pay attention to this stuff like, like we do. Who might say, well, listen, uh, Obama didn't have Congress, so what could he have done? Right. Well, first of all, he had uh, at one point 59 Senate votes, uh, arguably, right. six, arguably 60, uh, uh, depending on how you count the independents. But the idea that he didn't have any power to do anything coming into office with a giant mandate and large congressional majorities is just on its face ridiculous. It's just it's just ridiculous. So, so it's factually unfounded. I think people uh, just you know, sort of the time, the, the the length of years and history, people forget that, that he really did have that. Uh, secondly, uh, there were moments uh, in the Obama uh, uh, first term where he had the power to do things and chose to do the opposite. Uh, and, and one shining example right. of that, one really heartbreaking example of that is that the way that the bailout program was used. The bailout program, the TARP bailout, gave almost unilateral authority to the president to do whatever the president wanted. Uh, It was a controversial uh, bill in in part because of that, because it gave the president so much unilateral power. Uh, And one of the first things that happened under Obama was that bailout money was used to uh, finance uh, executive bonuses at AIG. Uh, folks may remember that it was a huge, a huge controversy, a huge scandal uh, that the Obama administration presided over using bailout right. money to pay out bonuses to the Wall Streeters who had created the crisis. Now, that was, uh, uh, I think it was one hundred and seventy million dollars, which is relatively small, although it's still one hundred and seventy million dollars. But it was, it was a huge story. But even worse, Obama and the Democrats uh, rescinded uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of bailout money that they could have used to directly help homeowners. Right. That, that, that there were tranches of this money that went out uh, to a handful of bankers, the idea being we have to save the banks in order to save the economy. But there was still $300 plus billion left in that fund. And at precisely the moment the Obama administration could have used that money to directly help homeowners, the Congress and Obama, the Democratic Congress, touted themselves for being fiscally responsible by rescinding that money, rescinding their own president's power to use that money to help homeowners in the name of so-called deficit reduction. So so the idea that Obama didn't have uh, the power to do more than what he did is just ridiculous. And the fact that 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 idea still floats out there, I think, reflects this almost cult-like worship yeah. of the Democratic Party among some Democratic voters to not be able to just acknowledge uh, the basic facts. And my lament as a journalist is, is that we should be able to report the basic facts and the facts should be able to be judged on their merits, not judged on whether or not they serve a particular political party. Because if you're being honest about the situation, you can say that the Obama administration 
had the power to make different choices, but it made a set of choices to ally itself with the banks. Those are facts. Now, you maybe defend those facts, say that that was a good decision. I don't think it was a good decision. But those are facts. And I think the only way for us to progress as a society is to actually be willing to acknowledge those facts and grow from them. You know, uh, 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 so important. I have a couple thoughts about that, David Sirota. One is you will well remember that not only is there, you know, I would almost call it the need for a hero among uh, liberals, uh, Democrats, as well as Republicans, that uh, made people uncomfortable with criticism. But there was actually, uh, at one point, a whole field of Obama-friendly journalists and commentators who attacked people like us who were criticizing him by saying the president has no power in this situation. I I wrote a piece calling it helpless president lit. It was almost like a genre of, no, he really can't do anything. Uh, So, I mean, I think it was also architecturally constructed. And just to kind of underscore your point, uh, in the summer of 2010, Tim Geithner had a meet and greet with about half dozen journalists. I was one of them. And at one point, Shaheen Nassipur, from, then from the Huffington Post, asked him about extend and pretend, this brutal policy where people would be convinced by their bank that the government was going to rescue them so they'd pay another year's worth of mortgage payments and then lose the house anyway and be ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 poorer. And Tim Geithner's response, and this was at the time that the press were saying that Geithner and Obama had a bromance, quote-unquote. Tim Geithner's response with a smirk was, is that a bad thing? When you have a group of people like that, they should hardly be immune from the kind of criticism that you're making in this podcast. Right. And we tell the story in the podcast where uh, Geithner at one point was in a room with Elizabeth Warren and uh, in, uh, uh, Treasury Inspector General, TARP Inspector General, Neil Borofsky, the uh, overseer of the bailout. And Elizabeth Warren was asking him about about this problem where uh, it seemed the banks were just extending out the foreclosure process, right. but not really ending the foreclosures themselves. And Geithner said, uh, according to Borofsky, uh, you don't understand. Uh, we're trying to foam the runway for the right. banks. And that term, foam the runway, I mean, that really does tell you the perspective that the Obama administration was using homeowners essentially regular people, as the foam on the runway for the bankers, as opposed to using the bankers who had created the problem as the foam on the runway for millions of people. And and at a certain level, what did they think was going to politically happen when they did that? I mean, what did the Democratic Party think was going to happen And here's the thing, you know, some people may be listening to this and say, hey, look, that's ancient history. I don't understand how that uh, relates to what's going on today. Well, you don't have to trust me. You can trust uh, or at least listen to Donald Trump's consigliere, Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon has said, quote, the legacy of the financial crisis is Donald J. Trump. Mm -hmm. That is that is a direct quote from Steve Bannon. Now, I, I don't think Steve Bannon's a good guy. Uh, I don't think he's uh, a particularly uh, honest guy, but that is an accurate statement. And my hope was that the that the Biden administration have learned a lesson or a set of lessons from that. And in fact, Chuck Schumer at one point seemed to suggest at the beginning of Biden's term that they did understand that lesson, that they were going to to go big, that they were going to directly help people. And in fact, the first bill that Biden passed, I think it was uh, fairly focused uh, not on a top-down set of uh, relief measures, but really on a bottom-up set of, of policies to help people. And I was encouraged by that. But since then, uh, what's happened uh, in, in the Congress uh, and at the Biden, in the Biden administration itself, with a sort of slow-motion uh, economic and public health crisis happening and the kind of nonchalance that they've uh, uh, that they've exuded uh, in the face of this not doing everything they can really to permanently structurally help people i think suggest they haven't learned the lesson because we're back at the point where lots of us are saying what do you think is going to happen uh, people are i mean there have been some good things in the economy absolutely um wages have increased that that's all good but people have not structurally felt 
that things have permanently changed in the economy. I mean, they Biden has put student debt off for a while. I mean, there's been uh, the, the the child tax credit well, was 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 great, but it, right. it, it 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 expired. So a lot of the floating through has felt temporary, and people are still worried and concerned and upset. And and the question is, once again, what do the Democrats think is going to happen? Just like what did they think was going to happen when they bailed out the banks while 10 million people were thrown out of their homes? Did they think that was going to 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 work politically? And then it raises the question, if you you really want to open that door, well, they're not stupid. So maybe they're okay with what's going to happen. Right. You know, David, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but but I, I've been thinking about that a lot lately. And, you know, back in 2010 or so, I think I wrote a piece called If Joe Lieberman Didn't Exist, They'd Have to Invent Him, right. you know, kind of hypothesizing he was then the Joe Manchin of the time, right? Hypothesizing that maybe they need uh, uh, somebody, maybe other senators would uh, oppose interventions, but they don't want to take the heat, yeah, so they let somebody. This. It's, it's called the rotating villain. The rotating villain, right, right, right. right. Rotating villain. It it always seems to be that there's one or two, and it's supposedly only one or two uh, Democrats who are the who are the uh, uh, inhibitors of change. And if we just get through the next election over the next horizon, uh, we can fix that. But then pops up another rotating villain. At a certain point, you start to wonder: Is this really a game between the Washington generals? and the Harlem Globetrotters, where the outcome is preordained. Right. Now, that's a really cynical view. Or is it WWF and, and, and everybody exactly. plays takes turns playing the heel, sure. right? You know Exactly. And it's a cynical view, but, but I can't blame people for asking that question. I can't. Well, particularly when you see things like uh, uh, um, Joe Manchin saying, I'll take a 1.8 trillion, and then they say, okay, we'll give you your 1.8 trillion. I don't want it anymore. You know, it, it, or, or, or Kristen Cinema just constantly shifting, you know, this chimerical creature who just, whatever it is, I'm against it. The, uh, you know, it, it, it does raise the question, as you say. I, of course, I don't know the answer. But the other piece of it is, it seems to me, David, that just as we learned a, a, a lesson in the meltdown and in the consequences of the meltdown, we've already learned a really interesting lesson in the last year or so, which is government intervention in the economy to help people works even better than we think it works. That I would I would argue that the various interventions, the deferral of student loan payments, the uh, child tax credit, some of the other interventions that were, t- you know, the 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 uh, rent, uh, the eviction uh, halts and so on, actually worked much better than we thought. And we're, we're seeing that in a little bit. I think it's still terrible to be a working person in America, but it got a little better and so on. Uh, and it seems to me, in my big fear, I'm curious your thought, uh, obviously prediction is hard, but my big fear is that the Democratic reaction is going to be, well, that worked. Let's stop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think, I look, I, I think that what the Democratic Party exudes is a party uh, that is a pro-status quo party and that it will do things to try to preserve the status quo. At certain points, preserving the status quo means throwing regular people a bone. Right. At other times, preserving the status quo is pulling that bone out of everyone's paws uh, to help corporations. I mean, I think this... We're going to help through the pandemic uh, with some relief. But then the Chamber of Commerce saying, oh, you know, giving to people uh, uh, too much unemployment benefits uh, means it's a disincentive to work. So then the extended unemployment right. benefits are pulled back. The through line is a Democratic Party whose ideology is about preserving the status quo now. They, the, the party as a monolith cannot envision a different new normal, a different uh, uh, permanent, better normal. Now, you can argue that the status quo is better than the Republican vision of, uh, because the Republicans can envision a different normal. Uh, They are pursuing, they are revolutionaries, truly, radical revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. They envision a different paradigm. 
And it's from my vantage point, it's a terrifying paradigm. But right now, unfortunately, in American politics, that is the choice. You have uh, the same, essentially, a an, an unacceptable status quo and a really, really unacceptable uh, new paradigm. And there is not much of a political force uh, that seems within uh, reach of creating a new normal that is better. And, and I think a lot of people feel a lot of despair over that, a lot of despondence. But I think not to make everyone depressed here, I think we have to recognize that reality. The first the first right. step towards towards changing things is to at least in, admit where we are. Yeah, step one is admitting we're powerless, I think, and, and uh, things have become unmanageable. The, uh, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about really in the context of your podcast, among other things, is that the Meltdown experience had a clear set of villains in it. I mean, there was just no ambiguity about it. Uh, the banks behaved immorally, unethically. They should have been punished. The bankers should have been pub- punished. They were not. The the uh, the President Obama and Geithner were anxious at every opportunity to insist that no laws had been broken, even though there had been no investigation of whether laws had been broken. And there was plenty of evidence that laws had been broken on a massive scale. They were eager to eliminate the possibility of a villain. There's a school of thought now that, to be honest, I'm sympathetic with. Uh, The Revolving Door Project just did a study with uh, Data for Progress about this. But uh, the school of thought basically says that the Democrats won't regain political energy until they identify once again who the bad guys are. I saw you tweeted out earlier today the, uh, you know, how profits are way up for corporations and so on. So we have people who are peril- economically imperiled. We have corporations doing better than ever. Is it time to tell the story again of how we're being ripped off by corporations? Yeah, I think, look, I think in polls, you see that people understand that. And I think the the fundamental problem is not that people don't understand that. The fundamental problem is that you have a political party that is caught in an impossible, uh, has an impossible formula. It is trying to say it will solve uh, problems, or I'll put it, let me reverse it. It is a political party beholden to its corporate donors that is trying to promise to voters that it will solve the problems created by those corporate donors. You, In many cases, you cannot solve the problems created by your corporate donors without right. angering your corporate donors. In other words, you cannot satiate your corporate donors and solve the problems created by your corporate donors. Example, you cannot lower drug prices in America without uh, enraging your pharmaceutical industry donors. It is a binary situation. Either the drug companies will make less profit. Uh, They are profiteering here in the United States. And by that, I mean, they are, they make money in other countries, other industrialized countries. They make outsized profit. They make healthy profits other other places. They make even bigger profits here. And they want to keep making bigger profits here. Policies like Medicare, to let Medicare negotiate lower prescription drug prices would reduce those profits, not eliminate them, but reduce them. That is going to anger the Democratic Party's pharmaceutical industry donors. There is no way to lower drug prices in America over the long haul without making the drug companies accept slightly less profits, without, in other words, angering the Democratic Party's pharmaceutical industry donors. So the Democratic Party is has to make a choice. And every time it chooses to water down drug pricing measures, it is alienating, uh, disaffecting, and demoralizing uh, millions of voters who are getting ripped off. And the voters know they're getting ripped off. So it's not a matter of storytelling about necessarily about who's doing the ripping off. So I think voters very well understand that. The problem is, is that you've got a, a, a party that simply... Re- effectively refuses to admit which side it's on right. and indeed is often taking the side of the villains that they purport to be challenged and that that just create i mean pe- people are not dumb 
they, they can sense that they, they, right. this is, this is the cynicism at the heart of the meltdown, because at least uh, for a lot of voters, they see the Republicans say, Hey, listen, both parties have abandoned you economically. I'm going to, uh, I, the Republicans, we're going to make a culturally conservative uh, anger based argument about culture. You know, both parties have abandoned you economically. So we'll just have a, we'll, we'll just make politics about the culture war and we'll win the culture war. And that's where we are. Yeah, David, that's so well said. And, 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 and before we go, I, I, I thought, you know, we'll just, if you're game, we'll both have like a introspective moment about this. Cause I, you know, I mean, there's so many dimensions to this problem and to the problem you've illustrated. And I guess, you know, my thought about meltdown, your podcast and, and all the issues around it is I think it's time for, progressives, liberals, Democrats, to let go of the need for heroes. And it not not Barack, not Hillary, not even our old boss Bernie, as great as as he is, it's time to start thinking of the movement and each other as the heroes of our own narrative. That's my deep philosophical thought. If you're game, listen, uh, I'll give listen, you the last I wrote, word. I wrote a book uh, in twenty eleven called Back to Our Future. And it was about the 1980s and how 1980s pop culture taught us how to think about politics. And one of the things that came out of the 1980s was the deification of the individual. Right. And and I always think about growing up in the 1980s, I always think about that uh, silhouette of Michael Jordan, jump man, as Nike called it, where he's a singular guy dunking the basketball. You see it on the side of shoes all the time. Not to get too deep about it. But this right. deification of the great man in history, right? I mean, whether back then it was Lee Iacocca or Donald Trump or Ronald Reagan or Michael Jordan, uh, it, it was kind of a all across the culture, this idea of the singular great. And it has now right. been systematized on social media. I mean, think about something like Twitter. Think about what you right. do on Twitter. You follow an individual. And I agree with you that this has become, in a sense, the religion of America, that we that we are encouraged to outsource our thinking, outsource our, our critical cognition to uh, individual, uh, I call them dear leaders, right? The dear leader must right. be right. right. And let's not think critically about anything as long as we're supporting uh, the dear leader and um, uh, echoing what the dear leader is saying. And I agree with you. The problem with that is that then you can't self-reflect. Then you can't reflect on and the uh, uh, shortcomings of the leader. But more importantly, as you said, you're not thinking about the the uh, collective action. You're not thinking about a movement. You're not thinking about how actually we're all supposed to be empowered to participate in our democracy, uh, as opposed to a kind of monarchical view that there's a king on a mountain or a set of kings on a mountain who hand down the policies uh, for us to worship. And I I think that is a huge problem in American culture. I think it's a huge problem in particular uh, inside of Democratic Party culture, uh, uh, liberals, uh, sort of, uh, as we call them and don't look up, lifestyle idealists. It's the same kind of concept that, that, you know, politics isn't really something to really participate in. Beyond just, hey, we voted for the dear leader. Uh, Hopefully the dear leader will do right. And if whatever the dear leader does must be right. And that's our political engagement. And to solve the problems of the day, these huge, enormous problems from climate change to crushing inequality, the dear leader, great man of history idea is just not going to cut it. It's going to require a level of of engagement that I think this this generation uh, is just not used to at all. I just think, I mean, you look back on history, not to idealize the past, but back in the New Deal, back during the civil rights movement, there was, I think, an understanding that there was a deeper level of engagement required uh, to preserve democracy, expand democracy, and really uh, improve the country. I think that's been washed away over 40 years. And I think that re-engagement to reject the idea that politicians are great, or there are heroes, and to actually think about how we all participate uh, in a movement. I think that is the challenge of our day in order to tackle the biggest crises of our day. In the words of Monty Python, King, I thought we were an autonomous collective. Uh, 
You are absolutely speaking my language, brother. So that was great. That was really well said. And on that note, David Sirota, my guest, is the co-producer and uh, co-story writer for the movie Don't Look Up. His new podcast is Meltdown. His uh, his uh, website and newsletter is The Daily Poster. David, great work. And it's always great talking with Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and this is... The Zero Hour.